Kevin Grace reporting to you from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm at Minnery Cemetery and behind me is a gentleman who was a baseball Hall of Famer. He was one of the youngest players to ever hit 100 home runs. He was the first baseball player in the National League to hit 500 home runs. He stood at 5'9 and only 170 pounds, batted left-handed and he had some power. The gentleman I'm talking about is Mel Ott. He um, played with the New York Giants. He uh, started his career with the Giants in 1926. Um, and then in 1942, he became the manager of the Giants until 1948. He played in three World Series. He won the 1933 World Series and the 1936 and 37, he lost both of them to the New York Yankees. But uh, this gentleman was inducted into the, the uh, Hall of Fame in 1951. And he's buried, he died in a, um, well, as a result of a car accident in 1958 at the age of 49, same age as um, what I am. And um, he was taken to a hospital. He actually had the accident in, in uh, Mississippi, then taken to a hospital. Uh, and then he wound up passing away a week later but he is buried inside of this crypt and um, he was born here in uh, the New Orleans area in Gretna. And as you can see, there's this nice little gesture. Somebody put a um, baseball on here. I don't know who signed it, but he's buried inside of this crypt. He's buried over to the right in the middle. As you can see, there's spaces for three family members on each side. And um, he is buried here at this lovely cemetery that used to be actually a racetrack uh, a couple of centuries ago and uh, if you ever hear in New Orleans Louisiana come out and pay your respects to baseball Hall of Famer Mel Ott Mel Ott was a New York Giants hero for 22 seasons, during which he emerged as one of the game's leading sluggers and a fan favorite. As a 16-year-old boy wonder in 1925, his size belied his power. Using an unorthodox batting style in which he lifted his right foot prior to impact, he smashed 511 career home runs at the time a National League record. He hit 30 or more in a season eight times and won or shared home run titles on six occasions. Ott was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1951. Washington baseball fans are in a tough spot right now. The Giants are leading three games to one in the World Series, and the score's now three to zero in their favor in the fifth game. But wait, Schulte, Washington center fielder, sends a tremendous drive into the left field stands with two men on base. It's a wow of a homer, chalking up three runs by Manish, Cronin, and Schulte, and tying the score in a double bow knot. Oh boy, what a climax. What a ball game. But in the 10th inning, Mel Ott, who helped the Giants win the first game with a homer, drives a terrific liner just into the center field stand. It looks like a homer. The umpire stopped him at second. There's an argument. Schulte dove over the fence and knocked the ball down. But the Giants claim it should be allowed as a home run. How about it, Judge Landis? Look, the umpires reversed his decision. There goes Ott around a home plate. It means four runs for the Giants, and it wins the game and the World Series. They'll probably argue about that home run decision here in Washington all winter. There are currently 27 players to hit at least 500 Major League home runs in their career. Members of the 500 Home Run Club are remembered fondly as some of the best sluggers to ever play the game. 
but we remember some players more than others. Looking at some quiz data from the website Sporkle, it seemed that Eddie Matthews and Mel Ott were the two most forgotten members of the club. Matthews would make for a good video topic, but I never forget him because he was teammates with Hank Aaron and was one of the best third basemen of all time. As for Ott, I didn't know anything about him until making this video. So let's learn a bit about Master Melvin and why he has faded from baseball fame. My name is Bobby, and welcome back to Stat Stories. Ott was born in Louisiana in 1909 and debuted for the New York Giants in 1926 while just 17 years old. He became the starting right fielder two years later and remained a regular in the Giants lineup until 1945. Ott was small for a power hitter, standing at just 5'9 and weighing 170 pounds. He's remembered for having a unique left-handed swing for the time, consisting of a leg kick and rocking back of the hands, similar to Harold Baines or David Ortiz, but more exaggerated. As for fielding, Ott was considered well above average in the outfield during his younger years, but his defense gradually declined with age. But of course, we're mainly talking about Ott due to his offensive dominance. For his career, Ott played in 2,730 games, had 511 homers, finished with almost exactly the same number of runs scored as he did runs driven in, had over 1,700 walks, and 110.5 wins above replacement for fan graphs. While these are all still terrific marks today, they were even more special at the time of Ott's retirement in 1947. Among National League position players, he was top three in each of these. His home run total was miles ahead of runner-up Chuck Klein, who had an even 300 for his career. Ott became the NL home run king in 1937, while just 28 years old, and remained the king until Willie Mays finally passed him in 1966. Also of note is that large walk total, which is more than 500 walks greater than second place. In each season from 1929 to 1944, Ott was top three in the NL in walks, and had at least 100 in a season 10 times. And for all you lovers of odd facts, he had exactly 100 walks in three straight seasons from 1939 to 1941. Now, Ott may have played for a long time, but he was by no means a stat compiler. Let's look at his seasons from 1931 to 1945 and see how often he finished top five in the National League in certain stats. Home runs, 15 times in 15 seasons. Runs scored, eight times. RBI, nine times. On-base percentage, nine times. Slugging percentage, 11 times. Weighted runs created plus 14 times, though had he had enough plate appearances in 1943, he would have another top five finish here. And lastly is War, where Ott had 10 top five finishes, though that is just among position players. And if top five isn't good enough for you, he led the NL in each of these categories at least once. Now, I chose to start with 1931, because that was the first year the BBWAA gave out the MVP award as we know it today. Based on what I showed you, how many top five MVP finishes do you think Ott had? 10? No, too high. How about five? Still too high. Mel Ott had just three top five finishes. And did he ever win the award? Of course not. Never even finished runner up. Now, there are a couple key reasons as to why Ott never won MVP. The first is batting average. Voters obviously didn't look at the stats we do today when evaluating players. I mean, most stats weren't even created yet. So batting average carried a lot of weight in their eyes, and Ott never finished higher than 7th in that category. The second reason is that there was no Cy Young Award for Best Pitcher. That award didn't come until 1956, and while pitchers can still win MVP today, it doesn't happen often. Of the 25 pitchers to ever win MVP, 10 of them came before the inception of the Cy Young Award. And of those 10, five were NL pitchers during Ott's peak years. Teammate Carl Hubble won in 1933 and 36, Dizzy Dean in 34, Bucky Walters in 39, and Mort Cooper in 1942. Now, all these pitchers were deserving of the MVP award, but you have to wonder how voting would have turned out had the Cy Young Award existed. As for the seasons where a position player won the award, Ott could have been named MVP in 1932 and 1938. I say that only from a stats perspective, but feel free to check out those seasons and let me know what you think. Despite never winning an MVP award, Ott was a 12-time All-Star who spent his entire career with one team 
and retired as one of the best to ever play the game. So why do we not remember him today? Well, we can partly blame these three, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and Jimmy Fox. All three were American League players from Ott's time who were known for hitting homers, and in terms of career totals, Ruth and Fox had him beat in that department. But there's a good reason for this. From 1931 to 1941, aka Ott's prime, the National League and American League used two different baseballs. There was no standard issue ball for all teams to use, and as a result, the National League used a ball that was less lively, resulting in a lower run scoring environment with less home runs. The average rate of home runs differed by around 21% between the leagues during this time. So maybe Ott could have hit closer to 600 home runs for his career. An interesting way to illustrate this difference is by comparing Fox and Ott. Fox had the edge and batting average, on base percentage, and slugging for his career. But looking at weighted runs created plus, which adjusts for league and park differences, they were roughly equal. It's important to mention park differences because Ott spent his entire career with the Giants, where they played home games at the Polo Grounds. He hit 323 of his home runs at the stadium, where the right field line was just 258 feet away from home plate, though center field was 483 feet. It's easy to dismiss Ott's power numbers knowing he had a short porch in right field, but he still hit almost 200 homers on the road, and I also don't think it's fair to punish hitters who take advantage of their home ballpark. So after going through all these stats, there are still a few final reasons as to why we don't remember Mal Ott. There have been several great outfielders in the past century. While Ott may statistically be among the best 20 or so position players ever, he may not even be a top 10 outfielder. Among right fielders alone, you have Ruth, Aaron, and Stan Musial, so Ott just kinda gets lost among the names. He also wasn't known for having a big personality and never grabbed media attention, though this is also due to playing for New York's other team. The Yankees, with all their star power, outshined the Giants during Ott's playing career, and it's clear today which team is better remembered. The last reason we don't remember Ott is that he didn't get to live long after his career ended. In 1958, while just 49 years old, Ott was in a car accident with a drunk driver and would sadly pass away soon after. He had served as a radio broadcaster for the Detroit Tigers in the years before his passing, but never got the chance to touch the lives of the next generation of baseball fans. So please, don't drink and drive, and never forget the incredible career of Mel Ott. So thank you for watching, I hope by now you're as big a fan of Master Melvin as I am. This was my first video in a few weeks, but I'm back to weekly uploads now, so make sure you're subscribed, and please like and share this video. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week.